Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at the shell. So the shell in in Unix and Linux and also BSD is a is a pretty necessary thing. But I wanted to start out today with a quote by uh, Ricky J. He said, "Every acting gig isn't the same. Every writing gig isn't the same. Every live performance isn't the same." The challenge is the level of difficulty or ease, and even that may vary. Everything changes. And the same can be tra- talked about from the time a program is written to the next one. It's always different. And then when it runs, it's going to be different because it's using different data. And that's the reality we live in. So, so we have to do something that will allow us to... Uh, adapt our environments to whatever we're trying to run. And so there's really three basic questions that you have to ask about the shell. First, what is a shell? And what does a shell do? And why do we need a shell? So let's talk about those three questions. So first, what is a shell? A shell is a program uh, which sits between you and the operating system. But it's basically designed to allow you to execute commands on your computer. And on Linux, it's referred to as the command line interface or the CLI. Shells stay in a state called REPL. And REPL is to read, evaluate, print, and loop. So that's basically what shells do is they, can, they well, in other words, what a shell does is it waits for you to enter a command. There'll be some kind of prompt, a dollar sign or something else that says, hey, I'm waiting on you to tell me what to do. You then enter a command and the shell will then interpret what that what you meant by that command because there are some commands that are internal to the shell and some commands where it has to go find a, an application to run. And so it will then execute whatever that command is prints the results to you on your terminal screen and then loops back and waits and sends you a prompt and waits for you to enter your next command. That, that's what a shell does. So a shell ex- basically accepts commands from the user and executes them. Where do shells come from? Both the name and the concept for a shell originated, here we go again, on Multics. Uh, so the term shell was first coined in 1964. Uh, Unix introduced their uh, their operating system in 1970, uh, and they added a shell uh, called the Born Shell in 1979 with the release of System 7. So Linux shows up in 1970, but a shell doesn't show up for nine years. Well, what the heck did they use to to be able to run jobs on on the uh, Linux machine in between there? Well, <laughs> I have a story. Always have a story. So I was working on, uh, I was working for AT&T at the time, and I was working on a 3B2. I had just received a copy of the Programmer's Workbench. Now, I've mentioned it before. Programmer's Workbench was more than just a commercial version of Unix. It also included a whole bunch of developer tools to help you uh, not only manage your applications, but also to check them in and do version control and there was a lot of other tools that would allow you to help manage your projects. So I just received that from Bell Labs, and it required me to compile it uh, because you never knew what machine it was going to land on. So I gave you the source, and then you had to compile it. So I'm getting, I'm running the compile, and it stops, and it says, missing shell. I'm like, what? i got a shell. I've got a bore shell. Why doesn't it see that? Uh, so I was like, what's going on here? So I got back on the phone to uh, my contact out in uh, Bell Labs for PWB and and said, hey, I've got this message that says missing shell. And, and she says, oh, you're missing the mashy shell. And I was like, what? Mashy what? Uh, I've never had heard of the mashy shell. I mean, I, this was pretty early in my career, and this was pretty early in my experience with uh, the Unix. And, and she said, yeah, it was the second shell ever developed at Bell Labs. It's also called the PWB shell. There's a download site for it. You can go to the, this FTP site and you can download it and uh, you'll be all good to go. So, I, I, yeah, so I go back and I get it working and it's fine. But so PWB was released somewhere around 1975 or so. 
And it was written by, that's why it's called Mashey. It was written by John Mashey, who was uh, one of the uh, developers at, in the PWB uh, lab at the time for Bell Labs. Uh, and and uh, it was also formerly known as the PWB shell. They used that shell, as I said, from 1975 until the introduction of the Bourne shell. But that leaves a gap, right? I got, now I'm, okay, I've narrowed it a bit. Now I've still got this gap from 1970 to 1975. What gives? What do I, what, what fits into this thing? So there was, uh, the first Unix shell was called the Thompson shell. You may also hear it called the version 6 shell or V6 shell because that was the last uh, AT&T uh, Unix version that it appeared in. But it was, I know there was some, and that was introduced in 1971. So you're like, okay, so we still got a gap, right, between 1970 and 71. Well, there was some earlier versions of the Thompson shell that they used. And uh, basically the only thing the Thompson shell could do is take input from the terminal, which was actually a teletype at the time, and uh, and then execute uh, the command and that it existed on disk. So it, it basically expected you to run applications. It didn't have any internal commands of its own. It, it was pretty simple. It, it had no way to script it, so you couldn't automate things that could only work from the terminal. Pipes hadn't yet been uh, included in, in Unix at that time, so you didn't even have those. So you couldn't just redirect the uh, input from a file and do it that way either. Pretty much stuck with that was all it could do. But it served them until 1975. But I didn't answer the question, the last question, did I? Why do we need a shell? What's, why do we even need this thing? Well, the answer is, is that the designers of Unix wanted their operating system to be easy to write, test, and run programs. I mean, that was pretty much what they were doing at the time. So they wanted it to be as interactive and as easy as possible to do that. At the time, most of the machines that the folks at PWB were working on were, were remote job entry uh, into IBM mainframes and also Univac machines. So that was the other choice. You could have a batch machine that you had to you know, formalize what you wanted to run and then wait until the job got scheduled to execute and then wait for the output to be delivered back to you in the, on a printout or tape or whatever it is that you requested. Batch computers are not as easy to turn into an interactive machine because they're they're not designed for that, right? They're designed to take a list of things and run it and then, re, and then stop. And there'll be some output that you can go go pick up. The interactive ones, like Unix, where it was easier to turn them into a batch machine than it was the other way around. That was right why they wanted a shell, was to create this level of interactivity between you and the operating system so that you could run jobs on the fly and didn't have to worry about scheduling things to run, you know, based on some weird time frame or schedule that was done by the remote job entry terminal. I have a list of all the shells from 1970 up until 2006, I think. This was done by Mark Pack, and he has a GitHub page. Uh, so I'll put a link below so you can go check it out where he talks more in about the different shells that are in that were developed on Unix. And that includes uh, BSD Unix as well as Linux. I'm going to show you this graph, and this is called a directed graph, and this also was a, an invention of Bell Labs. So you, you'll see the green boxes here and the purple boxes. So those are the shells. Green means that it was proprietary. It was a, a closed license, and you, yeah, you, you couldn't just take the source and do whatever you wanted to with it. You'd, otherwise, you'd be in trouble. The purple are open source, and of course you can take the source code freely from that, modify it, and either return you know what you did, or if it's under a BSD, you can just go off on your merry way and do whatever you want with it. There's also solid black lines with arrows that point back to the progenitor. So whatever it was that was used to uh, design the next version of the kernel, if it's solid, it means they took code from the previous version of the shell and included it, in the new one. If it's a dotted line, a gray dotted line, it means that I, I couldn't take the code, but I could take the ideas and the concepts and I could include that in the design of the next kernel. 
uh, the next shell for the machine. So that's what all that means. And you can see we go from the Thompson shell at the top to the toy box at the bottom. So that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit more in depth. Some of the shelves that are on that page were written for BSD and OpenBSD. So, now I'm talking about not not the I'm not talking about the distro OpenBSD. I'm talking about the license here. So some of it was formalized on the BSD license, and some of it was formalized later as OpenBSD. So some of the shells were written by AT&T Unix. Some of them were recreated for Linux, and some of them were just plain lost. So <laughs> over time, so, and that happens because. And nobody uses it. Nobody cares, right? The Corn Shell was written by David Corn, and that was released by AT and T as open source in 2000. Up until that time, you'll you'll probably notice there's two forks of the Corn. Uh, one is called PDK Shell. That's the open source version, and then you'll see K Shell. And when you get down to 93Q, that's open source. That that version of the Corn Shell is based on the open source code that was released by AT and T in 2000. To, but anything previous to that is, is well, I don't know. I, it, it could be cons considered closed source because at the time of the license that that was created, it was closed source. So, yeah, it, well, if it's not specifically released as open source, then, yeah, you have to assume it's closed source. And I think that's the way the diagram shows those. So today there are many shells for Linux. I mean, uh, there's probably almost as many shells as there are desktop environments or even Windows environments uh, for Linux. Um, some of them are quite unique and very exotic. Some of them implement very specific things that the designer needed from that shell. The Thompson shell is known as the version 6 shell. You'll also see that name. The Born shell, however, was the most famous of the shells, and that was written by Stephen Bourne. Uh, Stephen was working on the Algol uh, 68 project at the time that he started writing the Bourne shell. So uh, he had a very high affinity for Algol, and, and so do I, as you probably know. So the Bourne shell became the default AT&T Unix shell in 1979. It actually it was written up in a paper for the ACM in 78, so a lot of people already knew it was coming. It was really designed to have more modern features that we kind of expect, where you can do scripting. It had uh, more interactivity. It had internal commands. There were path variables. Uh, that was the introduction of all that, the environment variables that we know today, where I could limit what I was searching through on the file system and I didn't have to have it in specific areas of the file system in which to run the code. And it contained most of the features that are commonly considered um, to produce structured programming, at least in, as, from, as far as the scripting language goes. Yeah, it's the scripting language is very much Algol-like. So if you're familiar with Algol, you probably will have no problem with doing the scripting because it'll look very familiar to you. I uh, found an email by John Mashey uh, talking about the Born shell, and somebody was asking him, was it written in Algol? And he said, no, it wasn't written in Algol. It was written in C, but uh, Stephen Born didn't really like C all that much, and so even the source code has macros all over it that convert C into Algol. So if you're trying to read through it and you don't understand Algol, you may have a problem because he, he basically littered the entire source code with algol like statements. The next, uh, so Bash would probably be the most, most widely known for us uh, on the Linux community, and that was done by Brian Fox for the GNU project, and that was written back in 1989 as the default shell for most versions of what GNU was publishing in their library, and that was folded into Linux when Linux became available in the 90s. A version of Bash is also available for the Windows subsystem, so, and there's also a default, it's the default shell in Solaris. Uh, Bash support for, adds a lot of features onto it, and some of them came from the C-shell, like history came from C-shell. There's a number of other things that came out of Corn Shell that are in uh, the, the Bash shell as well. You can make Bash uh, POSIX compliance. There's some extensions that you can add to it if you want, really want to do that. Uh, the next best known is the Forsyth shell, at least in, in my memory. Uh, that was written by Charles Forsyth, and it, it was adapted for Minix version 1. Uh, that is an open source version of the Born shell, and without that, Bash wouldn't exist because Bash borrowed from that code. 
So that's why that becomes kind of important. Uh, Z Shell was written by uh, Paul Falstad, and that's becoming very popular on, on Linux, but it, it's been around a long time. It was written in the 90s. It took its design from the Born Shell. It borrowed from the Corn Shell and also the Tick Shell or the TC Shell, uh, which, yeah, it's a variant of the C Shell. C Shell was, of course, written by Bill Joy. Uh, so there's a there's a, many additional features, of course, that's in Z Z shell, as and also fish and yeah, there's just a whole bunch of them that I I didn't cover. At the bottom of of, of the list that's done by Mark is Toybox. Uh, what is Toybox? So Toybox is the the shell that's most commonly found on Android, for its command line functions and. That was written by Robert Langley. Uh, Toybox has a OBSD license, an OpenBSD license. It's uh, an alternative to BusyBox. Uh, and in fact, it's, I think, a little bit tighter even than BusyBox is in its code. And it can run on Linux, BSD, and even uh, Mac OS, and of course, Android as well. The other one uh, that's kind of significant is the Almquist shell. Uh, and, and I think that re really requires a special call out. You might also know this one as the Ash Shell. It was written by Kenneth Almquist in the late 1980s. So initially it was open source, um, a clone of the Born Shell, and it replaced uh, the original Born Shell and the BSD variants of Unix, which I believe a lot of them still use today as the Ash Shell. They, they are a variant of the Ash shell was adopted by both Debian and Ubuntu, and we'll talk more about that. But uh, you'll find forks of Ash on FreeBSD, NetBSD, Dragonfly BSD, Minix, and even made its way over to Slackware. Uh, and there's some quotes that are out. I'll, again, I'll put some links down below where you can find those So that were done by the early Slackware people, because some of them are kind of funny. So the Almquist shell was ported to Debian in 1997 by Herbert uh, Key. He renamed it to Dash, and that was the Debian Almquist shell. It also added some support for POSIX as well. Not complete, but it added a pretty significant chunk. So in 2006, both Ubuntu, Ubuntu adopted it as their default shell, and Debian replaced Bash as their default shell for Debian 6. Uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of different versions of the shell that's out there. Uh, so I'm going to end with a quote by Eric Allman. This one is, Unix gives you just enough rope to hang yourself, plus it adds on a couple more feet just to make sure it gets the job done. So that's all I had. I hope you enjoyed this kind of a, a quick look at some of the uh, shell history. And if you did, please like and subscribe. See you the next time. Bye for now.